Okay, everyone, you're welcome back for the session three, our final session of the day. And for the next 45 minutes or so, we are going to discuss the future, namely if we are unlucky enough to experience another pandemic of this scale, of this nature, and perhaps even worse, what would we do differently? So we have five speakers. If I could ask them to, to come to the stage and just take their seats at the table again. You've already met three of them. Mary Day, CEO of St. James's, Professor Edward Gregg, Head of the School of Population Health at RCSI, and Dr. Anders Tegnell, former state epidemiologist with the Swedish Public Health Agency. We're joined for this one by two new guests, Professor Patricia Kearney, Professor of Epidemiology at the School of Public Health at UCC, and Dr. Catherine Motherway, who is consultant in anaesthesia and intensive care at University Hospital Limerick. So I'm going to invite Patricia and Catherine to speak to you for a couple of minutes just to get their thoughts on what they've heard so far today and to hear their views on the impact of the pandemic and the response to it on the wider health of our population. So Patricia, if you would begin please. Thank you. Uh, certainly, thank you, and thanks for the invitation. I suppose I would begin by saying that even in the absence of uh, another pandemic, uh, I think there's a lot that we do um, and can do differently, um, and I suppose that the talks this morning have um, uh, sort of highlighted that. Um, and I suppose for me, one of the learnings um, for the future, um, uh, and thinking about this in terms of public health, and we heard you know, how invisible often public health is, and um, you know, I've heard people say to me during the pandemic, but the model said this, that, and the other was going to happen, and our hospitals aren't overwhelmed. It was kind of like, well, exactly, <laughs> because the different decisions were made. Um, and I think that's a real challenge that we face in Ireland, that, that public health does, and, and what's done in public health. And even actually when we heard about the academic health system, it was very much focused on hospital care. And of course, uh, a huge amount of our care is provided in the community, in primary care, by public health. And I think we really do need to move towards an academic health system, but it should be one um, that includes uh, public health and primary care um, and population health. And I suppose that the, the, the two things that I wanted to sort of emphasize were the ideas of shared responsibility and shared decision making. And I think in Ireland, you know, we got a lot of things right and we maybe could have done some things better. Uh, one of the things that I found personally very difficult was the emphasis on personal responsibility. And as an epidemiologist and someone who works in public health, I've spent uh, a lot of my uh, career explaining what epidemiology is, explaining that it has nothing to do with the skin. And so it was a time when, you know, suddenly everybody was very aware of epidemiology and public health, but I felt that the, too much of our narrative focused on the idea of individual or personal responsibility. And in my mind, that's the absolute opposite of what we do in public or population health. Um, and I think it's really time, and we've heard you know, the negative consequences specifically on, on surgical services. Um, we've heard about the negative impacts on adolescents and on older people in terms of social isolation. You know, our society has been hugely impacted by this. Um, and I would agree with Professor Brewer in terms of maybe it is now time for a national conversation around what we value you know, it has uncovered all sorts of and um, all the inequalities that existed in our society pre-pandemic. And you know, our nursing home, our migrant workers. I came across the phrase "hot bedding" for the first time in terms of people who were working, and um, you know, migrant workers coming to this country, um, uh, isolated in in lots of different ways, um, and being exploited by our society. So I think it really is time for us to to talk about what we value. What we want, we are a developed country, what we want to spend our money on, uh, how we want to live. And um, I think one of the difficulties in looking at the data and comparing countries is that it tends to look at ICU admissions and deaths, which of course are extraordinarily important. But there are countries where children continue to be able to go to school, where people who had dying parents were able to be there at their bedside, and there are countries where that uh, did not happen. And so I really think um, it's a time for shared responsibility and shared decision making. Um, and I suppose that's sort of on all of us to, to use our voice and say, OK, this is what we did. Um, and the thing I suppose in population health, the other thing we talk a lot about is social determinants of health. And I read a letter recently by Martin McKee, who's a professor of public health um, in, in London. And he was, it was in the context of a review of Belfast. But the phrase he used that really struck um, and, and stuck with me was the idea of the political determinants of health. 
And I think sometimes in public health, when we talk about social determinants, like where do we start and how can we actually overcome these huge societal challenges? And the answer is potentially in those who have the power to make the decision. Uh, and so maybe we need to think about the political determinants of health. Thank you. Catherine. So as most of you know, I'm an intensive care doctor and I'm not, neither an epidemiologist nor a population health specialist. But, and and for, for us at the beginning of the pandemic, intensive care for us was a true um, anxiety and worry because I and my colleagues were severely worried about our ability to cope in the face of a particular disease where we were going to face people with respiratory failure and we had limited facilities. And to be fair, we did manage, like our Swedish colleagues, to double our intensive care capacity in a temporary fashion over a short period of time. And we did need that curve to be flattened, and that curve was flattened. Um, by combination, I think, of government actions and personal responsibility, which wasn't all of it, essentially. And I think our population were extremely um, compliant and in particular their uptake of the vaccine as it rolled out has begun to actually make a huge difference to us in terms of our normal ways of life. One of the interesting things that we found in ICU at the time of the lockdowns was that non-COVID patients seemed to disappear. So things happened in the lockdown that meant certain acute presentations didn't come to us. We didn't see strokes as much as we did before. We didn't see heart attacks. We didn't see some diseases that shouldn't have disappeared. And it would be interesting, I think, to find out why that is from the point of view of our diabetic population who would normally present with strokes. And I don't think they died at home, to be honest with you. I know there was a fear about coming into hospital, but certain things about the way we changed our lifestyle for those brief periods of time did affect some health outcomes, which I think would be of interest from the point of view of our population. Um, so, I mean, they talk about this attributable mortality that they, that, you know, so we know we had 7,000 plus deaths of people who were positive for COVID. Um, but we know that our attributable mortality is not quite that high. So I, I think it would be interesting to explore that a little bit more. And in terms of our outcomes, yes, we measure it in terms of death and morbidity and disease, but also we should measure it in terms of the environment and the environmental impact of lockdown which was actually particularly positive for, in, in terms of greenhouse emissions. And I, th I think you can't really separate climate and that sort of thing from health, nor can you separate the economy and people's lifestyles and their economic status from outcomes in health. And we know that if you were poor, you did worse during this pandemic. If you could not not go to work, if you didn't have a contract that entitled you to get some form of money during this, you had to go out you had to earn a living because you were going to starve to death as opposed to die from COVID. And, and that was reflected all over the world, and it did expose those things very significantly. And I think as a society, and, and in fact, the idea of a citizens' assembly is an excellent idea in terms of looking at all of those things, because it's not just the ICU beds. It's the people who lost work. It's the people who lost their homes. It's, it's all of those things. And in fact, businesses that now are finding it very difficult to get staff to come back to them because they know they're not, not secure. So it's been a fascinating day, actually. Thank you, everybody. I've enjoyed listening to everybody. That's great. Well, we're delighted to have you, Catherine and um, Patricia, and you all, indeed. So if we're going to talk about the future, I suppose, Ed, I'll come to you first. Is another pandemic in our lifetime almost guaranteed, do you think? Yeah, so I've, I've learned a hard lesson. So I, I think another one may. Ha I hope I live long enough. <laughs> Um, to see the next. No, seriously, but I would actually suggest we, re, we reframe that a bit, though, and not treat it as, okay, we should certainly prepare for the next pandemic. But that I think that implies to say that, okay, once we get over this one, we can rest a bit and look for the next one. It sort of implies that we don't have a dozen other problems that we should be confronting right now that actually suffer from all the same limitations in terms of data and science for us to guide decisions. So I think that you know, the, what we should do here is treat it as an opportunity that there is so much energy and attention and a, a profile around, what, around population health and the importance of data for decisions that we should be using that right now actually to point it towards cancer or mental health or substance abuse or what the many other problems that we actually um, have all the same limitations for right now. 
Um, and in the meantime, hopefully that will improve us and the, the people that are really focused on infectious disease pandemics, they're going to do their thing anyway, but then they'll be ready prepared to, to handle that when it comes. Anders, how much will the response to this pandemic influence how we respond to the next one? Hopefully, I would even say like this, hopefully not too much. Because if we learn something is that every pandemic is different from the previous one. So uh, I'm coming back to what you're saying. Uh, hopefully next time we're going to learn much quicker what is the best way of dealing with it. And, and gather data on the international level so that we quickly can say, okay, this and these are the environments where the disease is spread and these and these are the risk groups that we really need to protect and so on much quicker than we did this time. So we can really target our responses much better. So we don't need to go for these broad responses that we know are so, have so many negative side effects. So, um, but to do that, uh, we need the data and we need it quickly. We need what? We need the data. We need we the need data. It, and we need it quickly and we need it analyzed quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does it all depend on the virus, Patricia? In terms of the response? In terms of the response. Does it depend on the transmissibility, its pathogenicity? I mean, I certainly, that, that's part of it. And I suppose <clears throat> part of the challenge here um, with COVID was that it was different to, say, flu, for example. And, you know, we had the emphasis at the start on, on hand washing and maybe didn't respond as quickly as we could have in terms of understanding that it was airborne. So I think the important... Uh, point there to me is that we need to be adaptive and you know ready to respond to the data and also I think really importantly understand the data and the source of the data and you know one of the things I remember very early on in the pandemic and it was when we were still at containment and someone was saying to me well there is no community transmission but at that time in Ireland you couldn't test for COVID unless you had you, 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 unless you met the criteria basically for it to not be community transmission. So, you know, if you, if, you, if you can't find it, it can't be there. So I think the reason I mention that is I think there's a danger sometimes in this idea of, you know, big data, 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 everywhere, not a drop to drink. Um, that you need, to, you need to really understand the data that's, that's available to you. And I think now as we start to do the look backs, we need to really think about the data that, that we're interpreting and the inferences that we're making from it. So, Patricia, you can't really take what we did now and project it into the future because, as we say, it depends how dangerous any future virus is, doesn't it, how transmissible it is? I think there's lots of learnings. I mean, one of the things we've heard is how um, well we as a society, I think, responded and worked together. Compliance levels were extraordinarily high. We can look at places where that did do things differently, for example, legislative um, uh, structures in Australia where they tend to face a lot more kind of natural disasters, you know, so they they um, have much more um, sort of onerous restrictions and much more higher penalties, but at the same time they have great supports in place as well. So I think absolutely there, there's learning just because it's going to be different. I mean, that's the nature of sort of health. It's, it's changing all the time, but, you know, we need to learn from, from what, what's gone before. Mary, when the policymakers and the strategists and, and you in, in your role, when you're all getting together to formulate policy, what, what should they focus on in terms of preparing? <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I suppose how you influence policy, because I suppose how that policy making um, occurs, it's, you know, it, it's not always people like me and, you know, the hospital system is actually at that policy table. So, I suppose the, you know, my answer to that would be, as a, as a chief executive of a large academic campus, how can we influence policy in relation to um, you know, evolving our response differently to, to the next pandemic? And I suppose going back to what I spoke about during my presentation, I fully take on board, I think you're right, it should be an academic health science system. I suppose where I was coming from is that we don't have the structures or the um, the programme of work in place to develop an academic hospital system in relation where you have the, the university and the hospitals working together. We've seen, I suppose, in the response rate in relation when you look at the vaccine rollout and, and the development of the vaccine in relation to what can happen when you have science and clinicians and university working in partnership. And I think we, we had a presentation recently on the development of the Cambridge Academic Health Science Model. 
and it was really interesting over a 20-year period in relation to how that evolved, but also to, to see that link with industry as well in it. And I think once you get that right, I think then you, you reach that out into the community and into primary care and into, into the health systems, and you, you bring all that together then in your academic health science system. So I suppose where what, what I try to do um, I suppose in my day job or in my influence and job is how do I influence to see that we do need an academic health science centre in this country and what the value of that will actually gain both in our response and in our delivery of healthcare going forward. Um, so I, 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 yeah, so I, I do a lot of influencing to be honest with you yeah. rather than actually making the policy. Catherine, what would you do differently next time round? Well, one of the things I would do differently is I would let people come and say dying relatives is one of the hardest things that I've ever done in my life. We, we prevented them for a period of time, short at the time, but it was dreadful. It was dreadful for everybody. Um, in terms of what I would do differently the next time, to be fair, I, I think in terms of what we had to do at an intensive care bed, we did. We just we just increased the capacity. That's that's all we could do, and send a message out and worked with our public health colleagues because. I mean, we just needed people to flatten the curve, which was, was done quite well. And, and we shared information as we got it. And one of the things that I think was good was that information was shared and shared freely. All of the letters of the CMO to the government were published on the spot. All of our data was published on the spot. And that's relatively new, I think, with our healthcare service. And I think that's a good thing. Um, I mean, we've lived through another pandemic in 2010, but it only affected half of the population, and they were younger, which is why it wasn't quite, uh, didn't quite make such news. But there were two bad winters in ICUs and across Europe with um, H1N1. And we learned a lot from that, that really helped us actually during the ICU aspect of this particular disease. Other than that, I mean... What did you see in the wider response that you think now Either there was no need for that, it didn't have any effect, or the effects were too draconian in terms of the, the advantages brought to the situation. Now, this, some of this would be epidemiological. So some of the travel bans, the two kilometre and the five kilometre thing, I didn't quite personally understand, mm -hmm. except that it did stop people from meeting each other and it did stop people from moving. I happen to live out the country, so it didn't bother me that I couldn't walk down the road two miles and back up again in terms of having some exercise. But that I didn't totally understand, and some of those things I think needed to be explained better in terms of their logic, um, and, and that would have helped people to tolerate them better. And in fairness, some of them were, we were never going to be able to maintain for very long periods of time. And I think the emphasis on, 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 on physical distancing and trying to meet and limit the number of people you met was, was really quite good. I think that Christmas, um, the, the, the Christmas third, 2020. Yeah, uh, th th that was predictable. Most of us in ICU were very worried about opening up on Christmas because we knew we would meet. We knew there was a pent up cultural need in this country for people to meet. And what we didn't plan for, I think, was the new variant at that time, that transmissibility. Um, drove that, and if I if if we'd, I'd like anything else, I would have liked of January of 2020 not to have happened because it was extremely difficult for for many people, and um, it would have been better if that didn't happen. But that I think probably was also communication because we all wanted Christmas. I mean, me included. I mean, tell you, but you know, but we we all knew that it was a problem. So that communication of risk. Um, between policymakers and 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 those of us who worked in healthcare, we didn't handle that probably as well as we could have. Maybe we didn't explain it clearly enough to our policymakers. Ed, what's your view on that question about things that you would do differently now with hindsight? Um, well, I think that we can. W there are some things we can do now that we were less able to do before. I, I think actually the literacy of the public around a, a, an epidemic, a pandemic, and what different approaches do is, is totally different than it was before. I think that um, the idea of um, social distancing, we, we'd never heard of that before. What does that actually mean? We didn't really know. Um, what do these 
if, if we're going to have a lockdown, what does that really mean and why are we doing it? And so I think that it's actually, we're better positioned to have just honest, thoughtful discussions between, w with the public in terms of the, the, the promotion that, that's given. Um, and I think that, well, that would be one thing that is, is, is different and, and that's just something that we can do next time better and more explicitly, partly because of this experience. Anders, in this country during the, the first and second waves, we had a, a, a policy known as cocooning for our older population where they were essentially told to stay indoors um, for, for most of their time. And we heard earlier from Professor Kieran O'Boyle about the impact that the loneliness and isolation had. And this is the dilemma, isn't it? Would you do that again? Would you have a situation where you close down nursing homes, residential centres where vulnerable people are living, and then have the possibility, the awful possibility of them dying alone? I mean, it's a, it's a dreadful, dreadful dilemma that any policymaker and, and government has to decide on. Where do you stand on that? No, I, I completely agree. I think we went too far there. Um, we have tried to look at it afterwards, the, the visiting bans, for example, and, and we are definitely not sure it made so much of a difference. COVID-19 was taken into these old people's homes by the personnel, uh, almost always. So I think we, we need to be more flexible, but it is very difficult to be flexible when you have so many different levels before the decisions has to make. And it's very difficult for, at least for us, it became very difficult to, to sort of give these nursing homes the messages that you should be flexible, you should be, you should give people the opportunity to meet if they really want to, if it's near death experiences and so on, people should really be able to come there. Uh, and that didn't transfer very well. We really wanted them to do that, but instead they closed completely because that's the easy way out. I mean, to make this judgment in each, and I understand that it takes a lot of time and effort to make these decisions in individual cases. But, but I think we need to think about that beforehand and, and really think about what are the priorities you have when you're closing to the end of your life. Uh, I think many of these people would have much rather have met their uh, sons, daughters, and grandchildren and, and taken the slight risk of getting COVID-19 instead of uh, dying alone. So I think we have a lot to learn. And, and this come back, I think comes back to that there is a lot of things we need to do in these nursing homes, mm -hmm. uh, not only medical things, but also things about how we can really work together much better to help them to, to prevent uh, mm -hmm. disease in that, but doing it in a way so we don't uh, hurt them too much. What do you think on that question, Patricia, uh, the way we, we dealt with that demographic? Was it, could we have done it differently? So I think the conversation around risk is one that um, is something that we could do better into the future. Um, and I think understanding that risk isn't you know, it's not a dichotomy. And I think that was one of the things, you know, that we said schools were safe or schools weren't safe and people ended up having very polarised opinions about it. And similarly, with, with nursing homes and acknowledging that there is a continuum of risk there and that there are different things that you can do to modify that risk. And then absolutely um, facilitating people who wanted, you know, if, and, you know, w once we're at a point where you're deciding to live with something, what level of risk you're, you're prepared to live with and, and, and make those choices. Yeah. Mary, what's your view? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I would agree, I think, with the other um, panellists. I think, you know, what we've seen there, I think definitely what we, we saw maybe coming through the emergency department were, um, I suppose, pent-up need in relation to, um, you know, did we do harm in relation to that? So, like, increasing progression of cognitive, um, you know, I suppose, looking at frailty and looking at falls and how that maybe is escalated during that period of time you know i know there's personal stories as well of people you know where you know, where there was um said that there was actually undiagnosed maybe vascular dementia that it actually well, was you know, was progressed much quicker than maybe pre that so i you know i i, I would agree with patricia i think that element of risk in relation to weighing up the consequence of what well, you know what was the harm in relation to um you know, keeping those 
does elderly population indoors and actually did we do harm and also viewing was there actually harm done as a result that we did keep them indoors so I, I, I definitely think that that was one of the areas that probably does need to be rethought going mm -hmm. forward. Catherine, I mean, was more harm done, do you think? I mean, it's very hard to know, but whilst from the best of motives, trying to protect everyone, trying to protect the more vulnerable population, but gauging that level of harm then? I think what we were trying to achieve was to protect people by preventing human contact, and that was interpreted as staying indoors and cocooning. We certainly know that surgically, in fact, if people cocooned and they were older, they lost condition, and some of them, in fact, may have done less well from their surgical procedures. Um, in, in certain circumstances, obviously, if you came in and had got COVID during a surgical procedure with the original variant, it wasn't great either. That, that did have significant outcome for bands. And I, I, I think what we needed to explain, I think, was why we want them to avoid people. But what happened was people just stayed indoors and if they were living on their own, that was very difficult. And if they didn't have someone who would come and visit them regularly, that was very difficult. And I know from my own relatives during previous visiting bands in hospital, cognitive decline, if they're not in contact with their own people, is a huge concern and problem. So I do think that the visiting bands that, we, that have evolved over the number of years are not good for older, frailer people and that you do rely on your own social circumstance to keep yourself um, well. Um, and, you know, while, you know, trying, it, it, there has to be balance, like obviously, if, you know, you, you know we, we, saw, we saw high death rates in older people in Italy, and they, have, they live at home, a lot of them, they're intergenerational living, so they were exposed by the virus, by the fact that they lived in intergenerational households, and intergenerational mixing, there is no doubt, was a risk. So, those of us who lived with older people for that period of time, I'd say we're very careful to try and mitigate that risk. But it isn't always that easy. So I think there's a balance, and I don't think there's a right or wrong answer for anything, if you know what I mean. But certainly in future, I think the social consequences of making older people um, you know, you know, isolate, we need to build a better structure around supporting them, essentially, be that in nursing homes or be that in their own homes. Or be that, because a lot of the social services, I mean, the home visits, a lot of that stopped, and, and, and I don't think that was wonderful. A lot of the public health nursing visits didn't happen that much because they didn't want to spread the disease, but I actually think, you know, in future we should think about that a bit more carefully. And Ed, what about the lockdown um, model itself, which seemed always seemed a very crude approach to the pandemic, and yet was there any alternative to locking everything down for a period of time? Um, there's certainly, all, well, I think it's clear that it works in the short term. Um, there's trade-offs and there's cost to everything, right? So it depends on, um, you know, there's, there's duration effects that, and, and endurance depends on on how long you're going to do it in the population. But I think that what we saw here is that there's many different gradations that can be considered. Um, and finding the sweet spot of what the right level is, given the level of um, transmissibility, the level of lethality, the population that is at risk, is, um, you know, that's the trick here. And I think that's where we can improve our, I, I think the science will improve us and hopefully we'll be able to make you know, find the matching and finding the, the, the right level of um, response more efficiently next time around. Anders, do you think it's unrealistic to close borders, to close borders of countries, even like New Zealand and Australia, which are so far away, are islands in themselves? Um, it's, it's simply not going to work long term. No, it's not going to work long term. Uh, I think history told us that already. So we, we knew that. But of course it can postpone. Mm -hmm. uh, and it did postpone things in uh, Australia and New Zealand. And, and during the happy uh, development we had this time that we actually got a vaccine in place as quickly as we did, uh, which I don't think many people believe when it, the whole thing started up. Uh, then, it, then there was, of course, a lot of gain to come from that. But in general, closing borders uh, does not really solve anything. They, it hurts a lot, and especially in a modern society, it's basically impossible. I don't know if you've seen the list with all exemptions that were made for people. When you said you closed borders, and then you had to make a list of exemptions, and the list was incredible, just to keep society running. Mm 
uh, you need people moving across borders. And then, of course, um, it doesn't work because those people will also take the disease with them. Uh, but sure, in an island nation, Iceland had the same experience. They, they managed to keep it away for, for a bit longer than many others. But in the end, it will come there, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And Patricia, on the wider decision-making front and those charged with making the decision, and I'm referring here to NEFET and that model of decision-making in this country, um, would you change that? Would you include a wider range of people, a wider range of, of interests in that decision-making process? So, I mean, I think, you know, NEFET was set up as a... Um, and an emergency response and it's interesting that it then stayed in place for you know a relatively long period of time and i think um in terms of pandemic preparedness it would make sense that we would plan now um, and certainly include you know I, th I think there was quite a biomedical focus um uh, within nefit um, and understandably you know that the focus was on on protecting our health um, our health service and, and the health service not being overwhelmed um, which we did see in other places but I do think into the future that thinking about and understanding the kind of things that we've talked about, about the impact of people living in nursing homes and older people living alone, that perhaps if it had been um, a wider uh, range of disciplines um, and perspectives. You know, but you know, would you include economists on it, for example? Um, so I, I absolutely, I think it would be helpful to have economists. And um, there were health psychologists, I know certainly. I, you know, and, and the other thing is people kind of were added and removed at various times along the way. So, but yeah, I think it was entirely a health-based approach. I wouldn't say it was entirely a health-based approach, but I think that, there, like for example, I don't think there was anyone from the educational sector, um, and you know, I think that was a, a huge. Absence. You think there should be? Yeah. 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 What do you think, Mary? Um, yeah. So, I, I, I suppose adding an economist to it, I think, would would be interesting. I suppose when we look at at health, I think the different. Health isn't just around you know health per se, and the, and the interrelation then between health and and uh, and your economy and and the business. I think that you know that looking at that sort of relationship, I think would, would be quite interesting. Um, I suppose in reality, to be honest with you, we, we didn't give it a huge amount of thought in relation to as you're in the in the trenches, providing and get you know working your way through the the pandemic and and the response, but. Um, I suppose it, it probably would have been helpful if it had changed as, as you know, the different variations of the pandemic changed and the response rate changed. That at the beginning, it probably was appropriate at the time for the, for the group that was there. And then as, you know, as that changed, uh, you know, I, I think that may be helpful. But I, think I would agree with you, Patricia. I think looking at that whole preparation part would give you an awful lot more, um, I suppose, understanding of actually what do you need when you're going into that pandemic situation. Um, and that definitely, I suppose, would, would be very helpful in relation to what do you need then from a policy um, approach. Catherine, this. must that decision-making body be, be wider, more widely represented next time? Probably, yes. But one of the difficulties is, I mean, this has been two years of COVID, but in fact, the viruses and their variations were actually quite different. They were even different in intensive care. I mean, you know, they were, they were actually quite different and with different treatments and there was different risks in terms of transmission as each wave came. You know, I mean, obviously Omicron and its subsequent is, is, is much different. So you did need a fairly significant, I think, scientific um, background there. And, and yes, there, were, there was an economic um, hit to this. And yes, you could look at its effect on the economy, but effectively, if you have a whole pile of sick people, your economy is not going to do that well anyway. So, I mean, your business will not thrive if you have people who are ill, in, you know, working in your workplace. It will eventually, it certainly would it, in the first two waves sh have shut you down if, if you had an open business with people who were sick. So, yeah, I, I mean, obviously, a very, a, as wide as you can is it's probably not unreasonable, but still, if you're aiming to protect the healthcare service, you need very significant... Um, scientific input, I suppose, would be the... What was the term. situation in Sweden, Anders? Was it um, entirely health-based? No. Uh, it was maybe in the very beginning, but, but it very quickly became the, the whole society kind of approach. We, for example, the schools were very much involved. We had okay. very deep discussions with the schools discussing the pros and cons of, on closing schools and uh, got their input because they, they had a great knowledge of what happens if you don't, for children who don't go to schools. Um, 
the same thing when we had regulations about restaurants. We had very deep discussions with restaurant or the, the sort of National Restaurant Owners Association on what kind of measures could they accept and still would meet what we needed to have done. So, uh, but I think that's maybe something in the, in the Swedish way of running things. We, we are sort of very much of a consensus culture and we need to have these kind of conversations to get things done in a proper way. But once these conversations have ended and everybody agreed, people really do things. Like we saw with the restaurants, they were in, for, which is, and the schools, which were just a few examples of how different parts of society really got engaged in, in uh, their part of uh, doing their things during the pandemic. Ed, how do you approach that? Because it's going to come up again, because there are always interests, vested interests, stakeholders in, in all aspects of our, our society, each with their own viewpoint and each with their own uh, willingness to, to lobby. And how do, you, how do you deal with that interrelationship between government and those interest groups during a pandemic? How do you ensure that, you know, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because decisions are made and ultimately they have a consequence. So how do you reduce the harm of that consequence? Tough question. I, w I mean, I guess what you're speaking to is we need, is the strength of our public health systems and structures and the people and the leaders that we have in them, whether that's in by, um, promoting and empowering them or training them, or in some cases that might be changing the structure. Um, United States, for example, respond, I saw it very different from being in the UK, where UK you have a very more, much more centralized approach. The United States were very libertarian, and so every state is different from another. And if you had a powerful, effective communicator in one state with people behind him or her, you could do quite well, or you could have could quite, go quite badly. And so I think that that's really about what we do in, in training public health and population health leaders. Catherine, how do you answer that? Because um, as we were saying earlier, there's the health, there's the wealth. The two are linked in many ways because, you know, um, if you, if the, 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 the links between those two were, were documented during the pandemic as well. But how do you avoid, I suppose, the populist politics uh, coming to the fore? I think having very strong public health leadership is really important there to demonstrate to those people who wish to continue to keep the economy going, which is not an unreasonable desire, let me t in fairness, um, why particular restrictions in particular parts of the economy are particularly required. So, I mean, and for that you need information, which we didn't necessarily always have in Ireland in terms of our epidemiological studies. I mean. It was, we, our, our tracking was slightly different, I think. It was always very difficult to know where somebody got the disease. And, you know, in terms of the outbreaks, we were trying to prevent forward transmission, um, as I understand it, quite a bit, um, because that was just the, the limitations of the system at the time. So people kept on saying, well, there is no outbreaks in such and such a place. And I'd go, well, how do they know? <laughs> they don't know. So, I mean, what we did was stop um, sort of we stopped gatherings that were elective, that you could actually have a choice about. I still had to go to work. Postmen still had to go to work. Different people still went to work and continued to run the economy such as it was in a very pared back version. And it was important for public health leaders to explain to um, the economy people who, in fairness, had a desire to keep their workers working and, and earning a living why that particular restriction was needed at a particular given time once they had the information. One of the difficulties was you didn't always have the information. And some of this was an abundance of caution. Um, I mean, so our Omicron response, we had huge numbers, thankfully less disease result. I mean, we, we knew from South Africa that, that, it, that they didn't have huge disease results, but we couldn't translate it initially into our population because they were younger, they'd had a previous wave with previous immunity, which was different. So we locked down very heavily for a period of time, which in hindsight, given what we now know in terms of our level of vaccination, may not have been necessary. But if we hadn't done that and we'd had a previous outing like the preceding um, year, we would, have, uh, we would have faced some very serious criticisms. So you'll always do a little bit too much in a pandemic if you do it well, actually. 
I think. And if you don't do enough, you'll have more death and, and eventually you'll blame. So there is definitely a, sometimes a need to do slightly too much. But what you need is public health and people in science who can explain to those people why it is necessary. And, and, I, and I think that in general worked quite well. Mary, we're being told another pandemic we will experience at least one more in our lifetime. I mean, what, what do you think when you hear that in terms of what you have witnessed, what you have worked through, what your staff have worked through, and the, the readiness um, for, for it? I mean, we, we, we won't have a choice. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so uh, as you can appreciate, um, yeah, we, we, that, that, that dialogue at the moment is very, um, I suppose, is, is very challenging on, on, on a workforce that's already very stressed out and, and under a huge amount of pressure. But at, at the same time, I think we have to be realistic that it's going to happen. And I think it's back to what we spoke about earlier in relation to that readiness and pandemic readiness and how do we, how do we de deliver, sorry, how we develop health systems infrastructures going forward to ensure that they're pandemic ready and like that's probably the language that we need to get into in relation to the preparation period but also in relation that you know if you're you know so for instance so if we're developing a cancer building on a campus we need a cancer building on a campus because we need a facility that's going to be pandemic resilient that you can lock down and you can still keep that pathway of going it's like what we spoke about earlier in relation to surgical pathways but i think it's also how we actually what changes can we make now how can we make those changes to, to feed into a health system that actually can be pandemic resilient going forward and i think if if you know if there was some element of a you know, some element of a, a round table discussion, be it, a, you know, a, a decision making forum in relation to taking what was good and what worked quite well, and then also taking that now to the next level. And I think too, too often we can forget what actually worked well. Um, and it may be, for instance, things like virtual clinics and that maybe need to be tweaked or they may need to be supported differently to make them more. Um, resilient and make them more uh, sustained going forward. But uh, you know, I do think we need to be looking at our, our at our learnings now, and at our health system, and in any forward strategic planning, um, we need to be using that in relation to pandemic readiness and pandemic resilience. Trisha, do you think that's happening? Do you, you you presumably hope it's happening. Um, so it definitely is happening. I mean, one of the positives, I suppose, is that we do have uh, public health reform. We have first consultants in public health medicine being appointed. We have. Um, you know, uh, new national leads um, in terms of pandemic preparedness. Um, we have multidisciplinary public health um, being developed uh, and hopefully will be resourced. Um, uh, so, you know, I think absolutely the plans are in place. But I, I suppose the thing I would say as well is, you know, we've got the climate crisis. We had, yeah. you know, a trolley crisis, uh, surgical crisis before the pandemic. So even if we were just to park the pandemic and manage to survive the next hundred years without another one, there's still plenty of things that we could do better in our health system. Well, that's the thing, isn't it, Ed? I mean, we're all consumed with the pandemic and have been for the last two years. But as Patricia says, there's so much other things going on that demand all of our attention and our policymakers' attentions too. How do you, how do you stop that from, from creeping back down the, the priority list from their agenda? Well, I think it's seizing. I actually think there is a momentum. There is a momentum of awareness. Um, I think there's there's um, momentum and um, a profile of, of science. I think that there's an imbalance, unfortunately, in terms of the science. And this might be my own bias, but I'm amazed that they can genotype the virus. And how long does it take? A day? I don't know. <laughs> and that they can come up. They can develop and test a vaccine and have it rolled out in 18 months. And we still don't know actually a lot of the structural policy behavioral factors that, that affected this, this whole pandemic because our methods that we use in populate are, are much clunkier. And um, so I'm hoping that this will spur innovation for us in more rapid Population science. Absolutely. Any questions from our audience just before we, we wrap up? If you have any, just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Um, and it's just a, a final thought from you then on, on looking ahead and, and the, the, the lessons learned and the particular ones, I suppose, that we cannot afford to ignore. <laughs> 
No, but as I said before, I mean, this has become a stress test on, on, on public health and our society in general. And I, I really think we need to sort of take those lessons with us. Uh, and it comes to the elderly population, and it also becomes to the to the hard to reach, the socioeconomic disadvantage, or people from other countries living in our countries and so on. And we really need to close that gap in public health on, and understand how to reach them and become much better at also supporting them in, in having a better health. And that's, I think, something we learned very much during this pandemic. That, uh, And if we don't do that, they are also going to be the ones hurting most during the next pandemic, because they are always the ones hurting most. So they, I think that's one of the things that we learned and really need to do something about. And uh, we need because we're never going to be able to treat everybody in the hospitals. I mean, we have the same problem in Sweden with hip replacements, long queues and all of that. Diabetes and other things. We really need to put more emphasis on, on preventive care. Because uh, we're ne never going to resolve um, the pressure on our health services if we can't stop the flow, inflow of patients. We really need to stop these upstreams a lot better. So I think those are two of the things. In, becoming better at preventive care in many ways, uh, and also finding what's, what's our vulnerable populations and how can we become much better at uh, helping, helping them. We're very grateful to you all for, for joining us and taking part in our discussion today. Anders, Ed, Patricia, Mary and Catherine. And before we do a final sign off, let me introduce the Managing Director of Healthcare Management here at RCSI, Union Friel. Thank you, Audrey. I'm conscious I stand between you and lunch, which is never a good spot. Um, Audrey, I was struck by the introduction to one of your questions, which sort of said, why, are, why does it feel like we're having the same conversation about healthcare year in and year out? Um, and I guess that's the principal reason why RCSI wanted to have this conversation. We are at a moment in time, and it's really critical that, that we don't lose or fail to appreciate uh, where we're at, notwithstanding all of the, and, and the magnitude and scope and range of, of really bad consequences of, of COVID that, that we've heard today, uh, there are learnings and very positive learnings that we need to build on. Um, most importantly, we've touched on many of them. We've seen unprecedented levels of cooperation within and across sectors, you know, be it pharma, policy, government, um, or, or, or whatever, and, and, and great things were, were achieved. We've seen um, a re-understanding of the relationship and interdependency uh, between the health of populations, economies, and societies. They're very different, but they're critically interdependent. Um, I, I think we've seen probably more powerful th than anything else, we've, we've seen the power uh, that can emanate from a population that suddenly becomes engaged and empowered um, in its own health. I, I think above all else, um, that's the asset that's on the table for us now. Our, our health policies uh, are enabled by political systems. Our political systems are empowered by the wills of populations. Um, it's not often that we've seen populations become engaged in their own health and for their own health to be up close and personal to the degree that it, that it, that it really was. So, you know, my, that's sort of my big takeaway from this event. Uh, that, that we don't lose the conversation of unlocking the power uh, of an engaged populace uh, to shape uh, the relationship that they want for themselves between the health of populations and the societies and the economies in which those populations live. So again, I just want to close by, by thanking you all. Thank uh, most importantly, our audience uh, in the room here and, and, and those joining us online. I, I want to hugely thank our, our panel of speakers and panelists uh, right through the morning. I think it was very provocative and, and, and very engaged. Um, 
I do want to recognize the ongoing support from our sponsor, uh, Novartis, uh, not only in helping us financially, uh, but also contributing their insight and guidance and, and, and program development um, all through. So that was that's really, really important. Um, I want to thank Audrey for her expertise in steering us through the morning and some penetrating questions, which is always always very good. Um, so finally, and not least, just to thank our own RCSI uh, events team, our AV expertise at the back of the room for keeping us all all connected, and, and to call out the support from Claire Feeling in particular. Um, she's done a phenomenal job for us. So thank you all very much. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all next year. Thank you.